Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Wait. Two seconds in. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, go ahead, Alan. <laughs> I'm Alan Tracy. I'm Rahana Power. Great. And today we have... My name is Eric Helgeson, executive producer of Tuscaloosa, a new movie coming out here in 2020. And I'm here with the director and other producer. I'm Philip Harder, the director. And I am Patrick Riley, the producer. Welcome, guys. Great to be here. So excited to have you guys with us. Um, This is the fullest room we've had, so this is a very exciting episode. Uh, We're going to start off with our fun question before diving into business. Um, For all three of you, what is a fun, interesting, random talent that you have that others may or may not know about? Um, I had to think about this for a minute, Um, but my special talent is being able to drive in reverse with a trailer. I'm really, really good at it. I can just, just. That is impressive. Yeah, without jackknifing for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) And I I hardly ever do it, but like once every two or three years when Mm -hmm. I get a chance to do it, I'm always like, wow, maybe I should have been a truck driver. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Nice. Nice. I'm a pretty good arm wrestler. And sometimes I arm wrestle down at Grumpy's, but the other night I tried it and they kicked me out. (laughs) (laughs) Phil. I was able to get on the news twice last year in the same week. And once was for being a dog parade enthusiast. And that was over at a dog parade in northeast Minneapolis. Nice. And then a week later was at a protest for the Northern Metals plant to get shut down on Lowry Avenue. There was a protest there, and the news came out for that. So I was able to get on the news twice in one week. So, nice. Yes. So you got a knack yeah. for creating news. Right? The, yes, I'm, I guess so. <laughs> I'm where the news goes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, guys, we're here to talk about Tuscaloosa, uh, a film that was produced here in minnesota is that right yes yeah um i guess i i should start with phil the director like how did you get attached to this or how did you come upon this project well tuscaloosa is based on a novel of the same name by glasgow phillips and um it takes place in 1972 alabama so when i read the the novel, I always try to go back to recalling when I first read it, how I couldn't predict what would happen, and I could almost see that this could be a really cool movie that would have a light at the end of the tunnel, as in we could probably produce this movie without breaking the bank. So um, I tried to get it made over time, but you know I didn't have a really good start at the beginning, um, just didn't have the connections yet. but. The story just stayed in my head for years. I just, you know, ideas come and ideas go, and that one stuck. And so right after Donald Trump was elected in 2016, I talked to Patrick and Eric, and we were all like, what are we going to do? You know, and I said, I've got a script that happens to fall right into these same topics. And both Patrick and Eric got very excited about saying something. We all wanted to say something. We, we, we felt kind of like sideswiped by that election. Yep. And mm-hmm. we put our efforts into making Tuscaloosa, which, you know, movies don't get made quickly, but now it's coming out in 2020 in the next election. And we feel <laughs> it's mm-hmm. perfectly timed because it, fe- even though we didn't direct the script towards what's happening today, it feels like an allegory for our current political situation. Mm-hmm. That's good. So when did you come on to the project? So I came on to the project kind of uh, the last one of the three of us in a way uh, where Phil called me frantically of like, hey, we got this all lined up. We got the actors. We got the lighting. We got the, you know, the craft services and makeup and all the people. We got it all lined up and ready to go. But people are a little nervous. They're not sure about this. I don't know, you, you know, like we want to go, but we don't want to. Uh, you know, there's some hesitations. And so he talked me into getting involved to help kind of bring it together and move it along and get it out of the gate, uh, kind of knocking the first dominoes over. And then it was like once it was rolling, like, you know, I went down, you know, the next week and they had a half dozen trailers lined up on the banks of the Mississippi set up to be Alabama. 
And it's funny, there's a, a, a set there. Well, not set, but the train bridge. Um, and then in the comments, some people are saying, it's like, I know that bridge. That's in such and such place in Alabama. <laughs> so people already <laughs> think it's there. <laughs> They're all rec- <laughs> already recognizing Alabama landmarks. That's excellent. <laughs> um, and this... And the film uh, stars Natalia Dyer from Stranger Things, which I wore the T-shirt for oh, you guys. Nice. Cause <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you said like you guys already had cast set. Yeah. So the it's it's interesting how this came together. So a little bit before Eric, Phil, and I were uh, got involved and attached. Um, Phil and I were working through the summer, and we were we just really wanted to make this movie. And then it's you know if it's the chicken and the egg, how do you get a how do you get a film made? Mm-hmm. And there's usually you either get, well, you you either get some funding and then you get actors attached, uh, or maybe you have a little funding, which is what we had committed to at the time, and then you try to get some actors attached. But the real key to it, what really just sent it into like overdrive mode, is uh, we got the um, producer Scott Franklin attached to the movie. So he's actually an executive producer, and he's Darren. Aronofsky's producers, producers. He did Requiem for a Dream, and it started with Pi, and all of that, and a little piece of trivia. So, Scott Franklin used to work for for uh, Phil, uh, Philip what twenty five years ago, oh, wow. and they actually they actually kind of borrowed Phil's creative ideas when they did Pi. So that's <laughs> the way I swear the story. But Scott Franklin says that he's a big time producer, and so we got him attached as a as an EP, which is great. And then that led us to a terrific casting agent in New York. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens she had just casted the pilot for Stranger Things. Uh, and uh, she was just like really had, just had a great set of connections and ideas for who our young cast should be. Wow. And so we got her attached. And then it's just amazing. It, it went really fast. So uh, we got uh, Tate attached. Uh, so he, he plays the, fa- the father um, or the, the doctor. And uh, so we got him attached. And then we got him for, what, four or five days. And then... Um, we were able to just kind of build around him really quickly. Uh, so then we got Natalia attached. We got That's Devin Bostic. Oh, Tate, Tate Donovan. Donovan. Yeah, I should sell. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Tate, Tate Donovan, if you recognize the name, he's been around forever as a character mm-hmm. actor. Uh, he's, was just, he was terrific. Devin Bostic got attached, Natalia, and then we got Marshawn attached, uh, and then that was kind of our core cast out of the gate. So we cast the, I mean, this is the amazing thing. We cast that movie in three weeks. We had two weeks of pre-production. Whoa. And we had just enough budget to go. And we shot this movie in 15 days. Holy cow. Oh, okay. Wow. And we shot this in... I'm stealing everyone's thunder. We shot this <laughs> in Minnesota mm-hmm. um, because we just had these actors. We're like, we got to go now. And we were able to find the locations and put it together here in Minnesota really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. And get wardrobe and sets built and everything literally in two weeks. Wow. And if you see the movie, it's you know, it's a beautiful film. Yeah. So it's a it's a real testament to the capabilities, production capabilities of this market, and and uh, and sometimes there's just magic in what you can do in your backyard when you have all those relationships. Right. Can you guys talk a bit about uh, what it was like to, I don't know, pitch the idea to film in Minnesota, or was that just always the plan? Or um, this is Philip, the director. Um, one of the plans was to find an institution that um, was in the novel. This is an old world uh, southern institution, and it's based on a real institution in um, Tuscaloosa called Bryce Hospital. And we looked up old photos of this. It's, it had been abandoned, and then it eventually fell down and collapsed. But hmm. I thought, you know, if we could get an institution where many of our scenes take place outside of the institution, because um, Billy, he's a 22-year-old just out of college. He's lazing around at the institution where he grew up on with his father, the psychiatrist. So he takes a summer job mowing lawns, caring for the grounds around this institution, and smoking a lot of pot, as in 1972. Um, so we thought if we could find that location, that would be the basis for our shoot. And we found it at Carleton College. I had a building there. Um, Blaird Hall. Blaird. Hall. Blaird. 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 Laird. Okay. Blaird. <laughs> um, it looked very much like the photos. It has the southern architecture, the pillars, mm-hmm. and also it's got a really beautiful manicured lawn, which is perfect for us. And it had a southern-looking house that was across the way, where 
Billy and his father lived. So here's like um, a third of our movie right there. Yeah. And they were friendly for us to shoot. So we started with that. Northfield happens to be right there. It mm-hmm. doubled as a downtown. And then we just fanned out our locations from there. Um, country locations mainly, but there are some local Minneapolis interior locations we used that we found would work for the 1972 look. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Was there something that you appreciated or liked um, throughout filming about the location here in Minnesota, being able to film here, or that you maybe were hoping for that you didn't find? Well, one thing that was convenient, um, we were uh, at a farm up in Anoka. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bruce Bacon, rest in peace, he actually passed away in the two weeks we were filming this. Mm-hmm. Um, but was actually somebody that I knew independently of Phil and met him years earlier. And a good friend of mine was also the farmer at this farm where they're out there. So it was this location. And then we also got uh, the the barbecue hut, the grandpa's house, the drive-in. And, you know, so at least three scenes shot, you know, in this uh, all of, you know, a couple of acres out in Anoka. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so, so that was one, another really unique location that was also very um, <clears throat> accessible to kind of uh, different scenes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I went down to Alabama last winter and, you know, going through there, mm-hmm. it's like a lot of it, you know, in the, the, the autumn, you know, the, the leaves are changing and that, you know, it looks very similar, you know, unless you're a real uh, a botanist, you couldn't really tell the difference between the, the trees of a in Alabama so (laughs) wow and one more thing I want to add to it is the film takes place in late summer of 1972 just past the election uh, of Nixon and McGovern in November of 72 Mm -hmm. so when we start the film um, Billy and Virginia meet and the trees are green and then by the end of the film they're blaze orange Mm -hmm. and um, we did some trickery with that we did some uh, colorization to, yeah. to uh, turn the orange that we had kind of green t- at the beginning of the film. Okay. But also we were able to point the camera. Certain trees are more green than others. Mm. And actually the day after we finished filming, most of the leaves had fallen off the trees and it snowed the next day. Um, that's how wow. close we were to finishing. So we were racing time to try to get these fall colors. And I'm really glad we were able to capture that. Great. Just to say a, a few more things. Yeah, we were just, uh, we were incredibly lucky the way Phil described it, the timing wise, because we were literally like on the cusp. You know how like yeah. in mm-hmm. Minnesota, kind of early October is beautiful and then it just changes really fast. Yep. So what felt like three months in Alabama, we were able to emulate over those two weeks. And the other piece about the shooting locally, um, and this is just a call out to the local film production community. Uh, you know, Phil is a, he's a legend here in town and we couldn't have made this movie without all the goodwill and incredible talents that rallied around Philip to get this made. And so that was a big part of being able to shoot here. You know, we had thought about going to Georgia and shooting and tax incentives. There's a lot of good reasons to do that, Mm -hmm. but there was just uh, an ease here and a convenience and literally in our backyard and locations that we were able, people's houses or things that we knew and friends like Eric had. So it was just, it was kind of magic. And we just had access to the right resources where we were able to avoid a lot of expenses that we would have had if we shot this someplace else. And even beyond that, the local actors, you know, we had a great cast that we were, mm-hmm. flew in, but then the local actors were just amazing. I noticed Paul Cram was on your list, so. Yeah, yeah Paul and <laughs> Bruce Bone uh, was in the movie. Bone was in the film, too. He was just just amazing. Uh, so, yeah, it was just, it just was sort of like a this little window in the universe right here opened up for us, and it just made a ton of sense. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk about uh, when, when would, what year was this produced? Like, when did you actually go into production? Um, well, we finished shooting it in uh, August, September 2018. But we mm-hmm. actually did, um, we wrote a new scene which created uh, a whole new three-day shoot because we felt we had to put an action scene in. And this was through test uh, screenings which mm-hmm. we did, we, we had people come out for our test screens. We didn't know, we didn't want our friends, you know, we want to mm-hmm. try to get an accurate um, yeah. take on the various edits. And I found that to be very important. These test screenings taught us so much. Mm-hmm. And um, unknown to us when we had this, what we thought was a perfect script, 
um, in the novel, they talk about something that happened. I don't want to mm-hmm. do a spoiler here, but they talked about a scene that happened. And mm-hmm. then w- I translated that into the movie where they talk about something that happened. And some young people who were in the test audience are like, what are they talking about? Oh, you know, that the scene happened. It was really violent and all this sh- stuff, you know, mm-hmm. the shit hit the fan that night. Yeah. And one young guy's like, why don't you show it? And all of a sudden we realize, oh my God, this guy makes so much sense. So we got stunt people out from LA. We um, did a chase scene with a cop car and a motorcycle. It was a really wild shoot. And once we got that scene, our whole movie changed. Uh, it, it turned into a really climactic m- moment in our movie that changes everything for all the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of like a really horrifying, violent, like a Rodney King moment in the movie mm-hmm. set in 1972. Um, and uh, that's probably one of the scenes that are in the trailer. You'll see the trailer. You'll see the action. It really helped our film along, and it just changed everything. And like mm-hmm. they say, you you write the f- film three times, script, the shoot, and the edit, and we mm-hmm. definitely did that. Wow. And on that scene, too, with the, the motorcycle, we we almost had it shot one night, but then we had a, the motorbike broke, and so then it was, like, kind of running out of time, so we weren't able to actually get it done. And this, you know, it would have been fine, you know, a little junior motorbike version of it. Uh, but then in not having that, it kind of forced us into really stepping up the game and getting the stunt drivers that worked on, like, Black Panther and Miami Vice and these, you know, big productions um, to come out. And it's, like, really brought that up to another level. So it's a kind of a situation where not being able to do, you know, the one thing okay kind of forced us to do something better. So mm-hmm. that was a cool opportunity, I think, that, you know didn't seem like it at the time when the bike was broken so yeah well how did you get over that hump like <laughs> you can't fake it, you know <laughs> stunt scenes don't get shot in the twin cities they just don't yeah <laughs> and the, sh- the short version of the story is like eric said we brought in these incredible incredible stunt coordinator <clears throat> and uh, three drivers in actually two wait one, it was a stunt coordinator, a, dri- a driver, and a motorcycle driver. And these guys were just all pro. And, um, but anyway, as we were leading up to production, the way Eric described it, we didn't have a motorcycle that was working because we, we flew these guys in. We were shooting the next day in the motorcycle. We thought it was going to work. Like literally, we couldn't get it running and had a broken fork. Uh, so then we had to just scrounge to find the right kind of motorcycle that was going to be stunt worthy and that we could make, match the, this motorcycle that was already in another part of the movie. Yeah. It took us. It was two hours before the shoot that night that we hit. We secured the motorcycle. I mean, like literally, I had sixty people coming to set. You know, stunt guys in. We're ready to go. And two hours before that, we still didn't have a freaking motorcycle. <laughs> and, and Phil found a friend's, a uh, friend's brother-in-law's brother who had had this Honda CB three fifty. Wow. And that happened. And then the other part of the story was. We had these beautiful vintage cars, um, and then um, and we were really excited to tell the, um, our, the person who manages all the picture cars. It's like, oh, this is great. We've got these stunt drivers coming in. You guys are going to love seeing their, their cars and these stunts. And all of a sudden, the, like the 65-year-old guys who have these beautiful cars are like, wait, what? These guys are from Fast and the Furious? Like, what, what the heck is getting ready to happen <laughs> to my car? Oh, no. <laughs> so they all panicked. So we started losing cars. Oh. Oh, and no. uh, this was the day, morning of the shoot. No. And so we had to rewrite the scene. It was supposed to be a station wagon. It was chasing a motorcycle. We had to switch it to a cop car. It actually ended up working better, but we didn't have a cop car, so we got one that we could dress into a cop car. <laughs> this, is, this is the day the morning of. leading up to a night shoot. Oh, uh, and, I mean, talk about the ultimate stress. But then we got there, everything worked out, and it was just like the most incredible night of filmmaking you could ever imagine. It was just literally beauty. Wow. And to make... Um, cars look like cop cars or motorcycles look the right color we yeah. use this vinyl so oh. we had a black 60s car mm-hmm. just like a hot rod but you put white vinyl on the doors and put a tuscaloosa yeah. pl- sheriff magnet oh. on the side and put a cherry on top and suddenly <laughs> oh and put it hubcaps works. over the mags right. um <laughs> suddenly this um, 60s hot rod turns into an authentic looking cop car <laughs> And the motorcycle that we used in the picture was a 1967 um, yellow 
uh, motorcycle, which is hard to find. Hmm. I found an orange motorcycle. So we put um, <laughs> yellow vinyl over Again, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's going really fast, racing with trains and all this stuff. So you couldn't notice. So vinyl <laughs> is um, your friend. <laughs> <laughs> that is good to know. Who's so, your vinyl guy? No, no, no. <laughs> so was that, would you say, the most difficult, like, experience that you had within, like, this, making this film? Or was there something else that stands out where you say, this was really tough to get through, but we made it by doing blank? Um, I think what was the most difficult was we realized that our shooting schedule was not long enough. Mm-hmm. Um, we solve these problems, though, and in filmmaking, we always are looking for solutions. Mm-hmm. And after making many, many music videos, <laughs> you have to finish the music video. You yeah. can't say, well, sorry, it didn't work out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so it's always about solutions, and, and we were always thinking that way. And what we did was um, to make our days work, because the first couple of days we were way behind. So we used this um, Movi camera that was very flexible, and mm-hmm. it allowed us to do these wonders because it was a moving camera that was really smooth and really great cinematographer Theo San- Stanley mm-hmm. brought this in um, and uh, what I presented to the actors usually like mid-afternoon to late afternoon hey we're about to go into overtime we want to do this one more scene yet mm-hmm. and we want to do it in a water <laughs> and, <laughs> which means there's no edits one take you have to mm-hmm. do it all the way through yeah well, Natalia Dyer and Devin and Mashant Davis were so talented they could handle that. Mm-hmm. They would moan and groan like, oh my God, I wish you <laughs> yeah. gave us more warning. Yeah. But they were so talented that they could do that. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be really difficult in, with some actors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But with those three, we could do it. And so almost every day, and Tate Donovan did one really long one too. Actually, a couple. So that saved us a lot of time. That mm-hmm. was very difficult to manage time. But we got through it. I think, to your question, managing time in any shoot, whether it's a music video or a commercial, Mm -hmm. a short, it's always, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you never have enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I guess, obviously, there are always problems on film sets. One of them being not enough time to shoot is always one of them. But not blocking out an entire scene that you do a one-er in, is, is that, obviously, like you said, it speaks to the actors. Um, as a director though, do you feel like that was, um, not, not a challenge, but like, um, blocking it out kind of like with them, how quickly did you have to pivot with that? Well, um, there was a couple scenes we were planning on Warners. There was one scene where there's a barbecue hut where a crane shot comes down Theo steps off the crane safely because they have to add weight or this mm-hmm. thing will fly up in the air. <laughs> then he's walking with the Moby. He's got to send the Moby oh. through a window and hand off the camera inside the barbecue hut. Then it pans <sighs> around to the other side. Then it goes out the back door. And thanks to Mark Wojan, um, our set designer, mm-hmm. he built this barbecue hut where you could completely shoot from any angle. It was a real deal. Uh-huh. Back doors, everything. Wow. We walked out the back of the barbecue hut, around the side. One of the characters puts wood in the fire. We end up on a picnic bench as YG, the rapper, shows up on his motorcycle and <laughs> ends the scene. Um, so from that crane all the way through, handing wow. out the camera through the middle, out the back door, around, putting wood on fires, steam coming out of a barbecue, all these things are happening. And um, it took us maybe eight takes i think but some of those Mm -hmm. we cut early because we knew we didn't have it so cut try it again Mm -hmm. um so that one was extremely blocked um some of the ones we made up at the spur of the moment um they're shorter i remember there's one uh billy had to walk up to the steps of the hospital and say goodbye to virginia after a a really funky first meeting that they had Mm -hmm. um it was really easy we just followed him up the steps got up to the door they opened the door, they closed it, they opened it again. It was very, very simple. Like the, You may not even notice these are oneers. Mm-hmm. It's just nice, gentle flow. And the actors are good enough to keep the holes out. They're tight. Yeah. So a lot of those, it's just maybe, I don't want to boast here, but it's maybe instinct from a lot of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a technical question because I 
love cameras and all that stuff. Um, what did you guys shoot on? What types of lenses? What, <laughs> you know, you talked about the movie and the crane and like, well, how long so, was so that Phil, take? Phil told me, uh, as a producer that he gets this question a lot yes. and he just says, tell him we shot on the red <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be impressed. <laughs> No, but all kinds of other stuff. Well, Eric, I handed him the the microphone, but he didn't know what we shot on. <laughs> that's fine because that's not his job. Um, we did shoot on an Alexa, but I do find this um, question. I'm, I don't mean to demean the question at all, yeah. but I notice now with digital that I don't even know what camera we're shooting on anymore. Mm. It's just kind of over my shoulder, and I don't notice it, mm. and it. So, um, sorry, I just haven't looked at what we're shooting on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Kodak or Fuji. Yeah, it's, it's just... just um, red or a lot. I don't know. I just, Ari. I guess I, I forgot what we're shooting on. <laughs> <laughs> and just, to, um, I'm going to be the tech geek for a minute. Yes. Um, Zeiss on, uh, uncoated lenses. Okay. Uh, which really gave it a beautiful, beautiful look. And to jump ahead to another technical question... Um, because we shot this, you know, really, I mean, we had an incredible DP and an incredible crew. You know, it was, we had a full camera, you know, unit. So, it, I mean, it was really awesome. incredible focus puller and everything. It was a really phenomenal crew. Um, but even with that, because of our rush schedule and also inventing ways to make the edit work, we did an enormous amount of visual effects mm. on the film. Really? So we have, I think, we have literally 175 VFX shots. Wow. wow. And you don't see them. Yeah. Yeah because we're doing a period piece, but mm-hmm. sometimes it was st- um, stitching together, you know, creating one or like, like that one shot that Phil described. There was a couple, we combined a couple of the takes and we actually worked with Splice here in Minneapolis. They did all the VFX oh, nice. work. Nice. Um, and, uh, and actually Clayton, who's one of the um, owners of Splice, was, uh, was our editor. Condit, Clayton Condit, who's, who's amazing. But they have just a phenomenal VFX team and, uh, and we had, we had to like remove rain from scenes. We had, there was all kinds of things oh, we had wow. to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so the VFX was a really a big part of the toolkit too. And, like, and I would agree with Phil. I mean, we got a really high quality image in, digital image, and then it was just a lot of work in the edit and finding ways to make this movie work, really make it play mm-hmm. cinematically. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of time spent on the, on the back end with post. Did you guys format up to like 8K or 6K or we, something? No, like we that, just or? we finished 2K. So okay. yeah, we, we we kept it in the kept it at 2K. Yeah, very good. So I want to make one comment about effects. Yeah, if you see the trailer, which is already out and mm-hmm. that'll be flowing around everywhere, the last shot is a distant uh, sunset shot looking out at the ocean. Mm-hmm. So for effects wise, we shot that. Where was that? The Badness Heights. Badness Heights. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah. where, where in Badness Heights? <laughs> there is a road that goes over the water mm-hmm. with um, water on both sides. Like a levee, kind of okay. Like a... But our drone shot, which was high, actually mm-hmm. looked up at a hill with some cars that were waiting. Mm-hmm. And so um, they wiped out that hill and they took the water that was on the right side of the road and they extended it out to the ocean horizon mm-hmm. with a sunset. Oh. With... Um, a uh, long road that extends out there as if it were uh, the road to Gulf Shores where they said they're going. Well, oh, the wow. The yeah, there's a bridge back there too, which is... The Gulf Shores Bridge. Yeah, or... resembles this strange bridge that looks like it's something out of Avatar, but it actually is the way that bridge looks. <laughs> wow. Badness Heights. That is really impressive. Yeah. A, a unique place to shoot an ocean, yes. I would think. Huh? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and we also, of course, we, we actually, one of the scenes is actually um, set at the ocean on Gulf Shores. So if you're going to shoot an ocean, okay, you go to Lake Superior. So we actually ran ran a small nice. crew up there for really just one scene, mm-hmm. and um, it's just beautiful. We shot at Piney Point, right? Duluth. Just just wow. just north of Duluth. Okay, and it just it just it plays as the Gulf, and we had to do mm. a little work on it. But just there's mm-hmm. some sand dunes they go up and over, and it's just it's just and with some color work. It's wow. just you would you're as convinced that you're looking at uh, the golf how many locations for you guys do you remember <laughs> if you had to guess i, I don't know. <laughs> you know tw- 20-ish something like that okay mm-hmm. okay just gonna guess probably probably <sighs> more within 15 days yeah Damn. and we were just wow. i mean we would just steal time all the time like we were shooting um we actually shot quite a bit right around minneapolis so we actually shot up in northeast so we would be doing an interior we were shooting at um, an office building at near 
Central and Broadway in the mm-hmm. Frost Building there, and we were shooting some interiors. And then uh, we needed to have a scene. It was going to be an interior for a um, for the police station, and we were trying to build it. And just we had, or we found a little corner in this this office space where we were in, and it just wasn't working. And then Philip thought of the um, P and A Hall in Northeast, which is above the Northeast Social Club. Mm-hmm. And like literally this happened, like we, we, we had it two hours and Bob, um, Bob Medcraft uh, got on the phone and we were like, we could basically rent it for two hours. You know, we worked out a deal and we flew the crew over there wow. and we did this scene and you see, you know, it's just like, it's like an essential part of the movie, but mm-hmm. those things would happen again and again, where again, kind of shooting in your backyard and someone was like, I have an idea <laughs> and you'd call and we'd just make the magic happen. Wow. That's incredible. So you've mentioned like some of the really important uh, key players on your crew. Like, tell us more about you know the crew that you guys had on this incredible film. I'll rattle a few off, and you guys can take over. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Theo Stanley is the director of photography. Clayton Condit was the editor. Mark Wojohn is the production designer. Deborah Fiscus uh, is wardrobe designer, costume designer. Um, the film is scored by uh, some some composers in LA named Joshua Mosley and Matt Hutchinson mm-hmm. with additional music by the slowcore trio Low. Okay. So they contributed original music uh, as well. And um, yeah, uh, okay, you can probably think, of, we can go a lot deeper, but that's that would mm-hmm. be sort of the, the top level town. I'm sure I'm forgetting people. Okay. Um, someone I worked with from when I first started in film here was Jeff Villers. Mm-hmm. He's... Um, kind of a hero in the film community community he can build anything and at times you know outside this barbecue hut we needed to do a big party with uh, strings of christmas lights hanging everywhere but we had it's just out in the country and jeff says oh i could put a telephone pole in there and like he did it like in 20 minutes he just came out dug a whole stuck of telephone pole in it and um at one point our cinematographer theo stanley said god it'd be great if we had a crane for that shot. He goes, oh, I got one in my barn. <laughs> <laughs> so he just brought it out the next day. So Jeff Villers wow. is kind of a hero of mine mm-hmm. um, because when I first started, um, I was a grip on a local TV show about home improvement. And, you know, I was saying, hey, they'd asked me for an Apple box and I would say, oh, here's a cherry box. And they laugh at me. And <laughs> then they say, get your hands out of your pockets. Why? Because the guy over there who's running this show, if he sees you standing around with your hands in your pockets, he's not going to bring you back tomorrow. So go get me a sandbag. I go get a sandbag. I bring it back to him. Take it back to the truck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I learned a lot from, mm-hmm. from him. And as I started making music videos, I, I tried to work with him as much as possible. Some of these people that I've known for many years, um, it was just great to have them on the set because they say you should really surround yourself with people you know and trust on your first feature film, which this mm-hmm. is my first feature film, mm-hmm. at oh, least a narrative wow. feature film. And so that was very important. Um, it was great that I could have a, a friendly community working with us because it gets very tense. Mm-hmm. And even when you're friendly, you get tense. Yeah. yeah. I think we have to call it Mark Harr and Bob too. Yeah, Mark Harr, assistant director, um, amazing assistant director, does everything in town. He handled my entire shoot. Bob Medcraft, who was in um, our production company that I had for music videos called Harder Fuller Films, and Bob was our line producer on everything. He saved us so many times, just completely saved us. Um, Brian Denny, who brought in all those vintage cars. Mm -hmm. Um, The list goes on and on. I know we're missing tons of people. It feels like we're at the Oscars. But thanks, Mom. (laughs) (laughs) We won't play you off. It's okay. <laughs> Say as many names as you want. Oh, did you have any mentions? Make mentions? No? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was funny just how, how the... Uh, it was just like a lot of people, and they all had their unique talents, and the, how we all just kind of come together, and it's like, yeah, this person bringing their crane in, and then, uh, like... Yeah, I don't, hanging out with people on set, and it was a lot of hurry up and wait is kind of what I noticed about it. So it's like everyone has their their uh, unique skill, their unique uh, project uh, job on the set. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And basically it's like you want to have it where the people can just yell sound, sound, and the sound's going. 
Um, but if they actually have to say your name, then you're getting in trouble, you know? So, uh, <laughs> and that's how this project kind of went along, it seemed like, where it's like, at, uh, you know, the editor has it right now, or, you know, we're waiting for something else, or, you know, now it's out uh, with the distributor, and they're working on the promotions with that. And, yeah. like, you can only really focus on one thing at a time, where there's, you know, like, the most important thing to be focusing at that time. So it's like, okay, like, working about promotion and a year ago would not really be a good worry at that time because we still had a scene to shoot or whatever it may be so mm -hmm. um yeah so so with all that and it's it just interesting kind of seeing how people did cope on set because it would be long days or nights or whatever and then there is just that kind of boredom of filling in the time before you know when you're you know waiting to get called up so you mm -hmm. know it's kind of an interesting dynamic on the set and with the people and I think that's definitely a big part of what he's talking about of like knowing people you know and like and can mm -hmm. work with and kind of lean on and that kind of thing so that really Absolutely. was a benefit of having it made locally it just knowing everyone mm -hmm. so absolutely so, so this is your guys or phil's first feature film uh as a narrative how about you guys what are, is this what film is this what number is this for you guys well mm -hmm. this is kind of the second film i've worked on with phil he actually okay. did a feature documentary on al milgram a local yeah. film mm -hmm. uh the uh, character guy in the, yes. the city's founder of the <laughs> Minneapolis St. Paul Film Festival and the U Film F Society and mm -hmm. he uh, has been working on his film his whole life and finally released his first uh, film when he was 93. So ours is a documentary on him kind of putting together this lifetime of documentaries. So wow. it's called A Work in Progress, uh, the world's oldest emerging filmmakers, kind of our mm -hmm. tagline on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and where, where can people find that? They, it's coming to a distributor soon near you, so stay tuned for that. Okay. And we will be keeping you posted. So, but okay. a work in progress, Albert Milgram Cinema Journey. That was the first documentary project I worked on with Phil uh, a, a, as far as releasing and putting it out. So that has been in some film festivals last year and got some awards. Um, it was an audience choice award at Bare Bones, a film festival, yep. a documentary film festival. Mm -hmm. um, and then has played in Europe as well and uh, a bunch of other fests around the U.S. So that was kind of the first uh, project that uh, we were working on or actually kind of got out the date uh, got out of the gate to festivals and that kind of thing and so now we're kind of coming around with Tuscaloosa and doing some of the promotion stuff and festivals and that again and then getting ready for the the premiere and big release on March 13th so yeah. after that you'll be able to find it uh, in the internet in the cloud and everywhere nice cool and since we time travel it was already released <laughs> yes. March 13th. It's the yes. beauty so of a podcast. We were really happy travel. today and yesterday. Now this is um, March 6th, I guess we're at, because it got on the front page of the um, Apple iTunes. And so mm -hmm. that was a big wow. win That's for us. Huge. We were so pleased to see that. Yeah. And so we're just hoping for the best. A um, lot of great press and a lot of great promotion and doing like this podcast right now. Mm -hmm. Everything helps. And Absolutely. we're going to be at the... Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival, April 10th. It's a Friday at 7 oh. o'clock. Nice. It's exciting. And oh, yeah. pa Patrick, you're... Yeah, so, so for me, um, this, is, this is the first dramatic feature that I've produced. Uh, oh. But I've, the, the real quick story is I spent my 20s working in the film business. Uh, I started out as a writer. Uh, there's a whole long story about that. Um, so I, uh, and I w worked out in um, LA for a while, worked for Walt Disney Studios, um, then ended up back here as a punk rock musician and a writer for a while, mm -hmm. then ended up in tech, and then I had a 15-year run in tech, and then I'm back producing movies. But mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work with the Sundance Institute, so at the mm -hmm. Filmmakers Lab, if you guys are familiar yeah. with that, mm -hmm. I, was, I was an assistant director there for four, four years. Wow. So it was, that was, I think... For me, in terms of, I think there's two things I was able to bring this project. One was getting to work with, I guess it was the eight different directors I got to work with at um, uh, Sundance and getting to be, you know, it was a master's class in filmmaking where it's like, it's a director and it's Robert Redford and it's, you know, Ed Harris and we're making, a, we're shooting a scene, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. the AD. <laughs> and so really learning how 
from the best in the business how to direct the camera, mm-hmm. how to direct the actors. So I just soaked all that up and also got a really great network too. What out was of that, that like? Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, if you, um, it was one of the best experiences of my life. You're, it's like filmmakers summer camp. You go there for a month in the mountains. <laughs> wow. And it's, uh, it's at Redford's, you know, resort. And, um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, you, you can't even explain it. It's the most magical thing I think I've ever done. But I just really, really learned just mm-hmm. the beauty of filmmaking and doing that. And then mm-hmm. once I sold my company a couple years ago, it was about four years ago, I was really anxious to kind of get into, um, back into filmmaking. So, but then I became a businessman. Yeah. Uh, as a CEO of a tech company. So mm-hmm. I, that was the producing skills I was missing. Right. So mm-hmm. then it was like business, craft of filmmaking, kind of knowing how to run teams and you know how to make things happen. And those things came together really well. And Philip and I have been friends for 20 years. And I, just, I saw the script. It was like, we got to make this. And we just jumped in and I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> Absolutely. And, but it's been amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience of making a film based on a book, especially a book that you clearly like feel so much for um well the book was um as many books are they're vetted already so that's Mm -hmm. a great thing so we're starting well in advance before we even start writing a single word on the page for the script then the next challenge is how can you translate it um in the novel it the entire story is told through billy's um experience we never leave either billy's imagination or what he sees. Mm -hmm. And we we changed that a bit by going across town. The stunt scene we told you about, Mm -hmm. you know, Billy only heard about it later, this this violent scene that happened in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Um, But we showed the audience that, and then Billy heard about it later. Same story, but we just showed it. Mm -hmm. Um, And another thing I changed, um, which was a big deal, was Billy and his best friend Nigel, two... um, young adults who have grown apart now. Nigel is African-American, Billy is white with white privilege. Um, Billy just wants to lazy around and not deal with the problems that are happening in 1972 Alabama. And Nigel is frustrated with the civil rights movement and he wants to fight back. Mm-hmm. And he, um, these two have a long history, grew up together. Um, so in the novel, there's all these stories about them as three-year-olds, five-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 13-year-olds, mm-hmm. all these things that they did, they keep sprinkling those in. And in order for us to do all of those scenes, it was too much. It's a lot of casting. It's a lot of worlds. So I just tried to put some of that into their conversation at age 21, 22 years old mm-hmm. to try to tell that backstory for better or for worse. But it gave us a light at the end of the tunnel and it allowed us to actually get the film made. And perhaps, for better or for worse again, it allows us to deal with the story at that time Mm -hmm. rather than keep jumping around to too many uh, different eras. I could see, you know, if we had unlimited budget, maybe that would be cool too, but we didn't. So we used what we had and that really got the movie going. When I got rid of all those flashbacks Mm -hmm. from the different ages, suddenly I could see we could make this thing. And it really tightened the story a lot too. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the biggest challenge from taking it from a novel to a script. And then once we had a script, we thought this is tight and, and while we're shooting, all these things are happening in the world. Me too, mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter, all these things. And we started to see we needed to react to that really quick. So we started yeah. writing scenes on the set, flushing out some of the characters like wow. mm-hmm. YG, he plays like a Black Panther guy who's just come back from Vietnam, drafted against his will, Mm -hmm. and is thrown back into Tuscaloosa where he's treated like crap as a black man in Mm -hmm. 1972 Alabama. And his character in the novel is a very side character, but YG himself has a really interesting history. He's a rapper from Compton. He's, you know, had a lot of issues growing up, a lot of things he's done even today, you know. He's he's, um, very controversial to say the least. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote that with him to build his character um, and build this Vietnam veterans character. Mm -hmm. And so we listened to interviews of Vietnam vets that were recorded in 1971. They were soldiers at the time in Vietnam, Mm -hmm. black soldiers. We wrote these down and I told YG to just put it in your own words and use this as a guide. And we shot one scene around this campfire on his day off. We bought him a 
tickets to the Packers Vikings game. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, wow. he stayed an extra day because mm-hmm. I was really enamored with him once mm-hmm. I saw him on screen and I knew he yeah. could not be a side character. Mm-hmm. And we're so glad we shot that stuff because it flushed out our story and allowed us to react to some of the changing times that were happening right while we're shooting as mm-hmm. we're trying to keep up with these extremely right. volatile political times. Yeah. Wow. And time, timely more it could not be. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it's going to find its place here in 2020. Um, I did have one quick question about distribution. I don't know who would like to talk about that. Uh, how early on did distribution become a, you know, part of the conversation? Obviously, it's always a part of it, but... Um, when did they come on board? I guess uh, for me, it was always part of the conversation. And uh, like the way I guess I saw my role coming into this is like, you know, there is a million fires coming up that Phil's dealing with as they're shooting it day to day. But then kind of from the back end, it's like what needs to be getting done so that does to get done in a reasonable amount of time. And so Mm -hmm. it's like Mm -hmm. that was always kind of something in my mind. And it's like, how are we lining it up to get distribution or what are we try, you know finally trying to do like just getting this to even play at Sundance or something like awesome that's great it's you know not that it did but like um it, you know that that's fine but it only gets you so far so it's like how do we really get people seeing this and getting an audience and like finding people that it connects with and finding ways um, to get it out there. And, and and then even with that is like having the screening kind of event. So we'd have like 20 to 30 people over and kind of seeing how it would connect with audiences. And then along the way, like each, uh, each version was an improvement. Mm-hmm. So, um, but always with kind of uh, intent of getting out and having it distributed because yeah. that seems to be where so many projects stop. You know, it's like, oh, this really cool thing, or yeah, we even got it to a couple of fests, and that's awesome. But then it's like, how do you really get the audience there? And all your friends are like, well, okay, download it, you know. Mm-hmm. So to actually to get it to that point, um, you know, beyond YouTube where you can just post anything, mm-hmm. um, but to really get in the network of, you know, the streaming services and that. Right. Because nowadays things are just moving so much quicker. I mean, we're looking at a business where uh, if you go theatrical, you, you know, lose some of the edge with the OTT services or uh, do you do day and day? Did you guys, I don't, I don't know what you're. Yeah. Well, so what we have right now is uh, the 2020 premiere on March 13th, mm-hmm. and then it'll be also playing in 10 cities, um, opening then as well. Yeah, and then also you'll be able to find it and stream it and that kind of thing. So once it is, you know, past the time that it's in the theaters, people yeah. will still be able to go out and find it. So, um, and then we're also probably going to do some independent screening events uh, and other runs through you know past then as well so stay tuned for that right and it comes out which netflix and many organizations are doing now it comes Mm -hmm. out in theaters and video on demand on the same day Mm -hmm. okay so a lot of people will be um probably just purchasing it Mm -hmm. because it you know a lot of people don't go to cinemas anymore Mm -hmm. everybody's trying to keep up with the changing uh distribution model Mm -hmm. and you know, six months ago, it was different than it is today. So we're learning really fast. Yeah. And uh, we just have to go with the flow, um, get the best advice. And we're getting some really great press right now. Um, and as I said, that front page of Apple iTunes, so people will go to that. Yeah. We're, of course, we're pounding the name Natalia Dyer of Stranger Things, mm-hmm. <laughs> Rapper YG. Yeah. These things really help. Yes. And that's something also I do want to talk about a little bit for filmmakers because this is something I learned so much about filmmaking when making this movie Mm -hmm. is it doesn't matter what size movie you're making. It can be the most low budget uh, independent film. If you Mm -hmm. can get a name, which you can get, of course you need a good story, a good script and and you need to prove that you're going to deliver a good product for them. If you can get any kind of name, everything you do down the line is going to help you get this movie out and the bonus is these talented actors that have a lot of experience and are somewhat known or well known they bring so much experience and make the director's job so much easier 
So I tell everybody now, it doesn't matter what size movie you have, get a casting agent, beg, mm. borrow, steal, whatever it is, drop every name you know to get a casting agent mm. and get at least one person because you're going to work just as hard in that movie, spend just as much money, and you can get people for SAG minimum. And mm. uh, it's very affordable. You might make a deal at the back end, which we had to do, mm. but this is something that's crucial to the filmmaking process that I learned on Tuscaloosa. Mm. That's great. That's great knowledge. Um, so there it is, kids. Get a casting. Yeah. Try. Yeah, that was really key. And just to you know, kind of round out the distribution strategy, like uh, the, the plan was this, which was, hey, let's try and get into the major fests. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, it was Sundance and South by um, Tribeca, TIFF. And we said, if we don't get into one of those, um, then let's, um, and we actually started this last summer. Let's also have a sales strategy going at the same yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is um, there's so much great content being made. Um, and there's so many, there's even films that do well at fests that don't get deals. Mm-hmm. Right. So we were like, we got to get this, we got to get this out. So we had two executive producers in LA um, that are attached to the movie too, and they're experienced sales. They kind of function as our sales agents. Mm-hmm. So we were able to show this l- last summer all around town. Everyone looked at it, you know, Netflix, HBO. We, we, we ran through the whole gamut trying to find the right home for it, and it was the cast that made that possible. Mm-hmm. And then we eventually ended up with, you know, four or five offers that came in, and uh, we were able to make the best deal. But we were kind of, you know, had the sales strategy coupled with maybe TIFF is going to happen at the end. Maybe it's, you kind of play everything right. against it. Mm-hmm. But it, in the end, you know, it's about just, you know, finishing a great movie, packaging it up, and the, the mm-hmm. casting has been, was critical to us getting a good deal. That's that's great, yeah. I, I always think about that because I know names, I mean, they have followings. It's plain and simple. But um, when you're making your own film, it's just kind of hard to know, like, okay, yes, I have a minimum budget. This is not going to be, you know, high-level indie, I suppose you could call it. So, yeah, uh, yeah. There, there are definitely challenges, and that comes from funding and all sorts of things. And that's obviously why you guys, I suppose, chose to come to Minnesota instead of go to Georgia or wherever, or New Mexico or anything else. Well, yeah. I mean, it was just, we were just able to just do this in our backyard, and that was, that ended up being a savings for us. I think that's my yeah. answering the question. Yeah. So yeah. It, was just, it was just having yeah, access to those resources and um, the power of community here. Uh, and then we had the right, you know, the right team members on the coasts. Helping Good. us, which were essential with casting and sales and what you deal need. making and all yeah. that, yeah. And we're, and knowing how to, uh, you know, work your way through SAG, you know, all of that. We it was mm-hmm. sort of we had to learn a lot of things really quickly. Mm-hmm. Cool. So you mentioned that it's going to be showing in ten cities. Is Minneapolis one of those cities? So um, in the initial release, mm-hmm. the ten cities, it is not because okay. we're going to be playing at the Minneapolis International St. Paul that makes Film sense. Festival. So the deal yes. we worked out was uh, they they would not let us play there mm-hmm. if we were, if we had already played publicly okay. in the Twin Cities, and we felt like we would it was a better tie into the film festival. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're Friday night at seven p.m. so opening yeah. weekend. So it's you know, it's going to be a great showing for us, and we and we just really love the idea of attaching this project that was made right here in the backyard to the, to mm-hmm. the film festival just felt right. Absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, that is where you need to be. Yes. The date again. Yeah. So day and date release of the film is March 13th, right. locally Minneapolis, St. Paul international film festival, August 10th, April, April. April 10th. <laughs> it's been a long day. April yes. 10th. It's been a long movie. <laughs> April 10th at 7 PM. And that'll be at St. Anthony, Maine. Perfect. That's April exciting. 10th. And then, after the film festival, we'll probably do a run then, mm-hmm. uh, probably like okay. a week run, mm-hmm. um, to be determined. Good. But let okay. the festival settle, yeah. and then we're free to just uh, show, show it here in town. Yeah. That's so if exciting. you want to see it on the big screen, April tenth, seven p.m. <laughs> seven p.m. <laughs> well, we did. Um, we had a test screening for cast and crew, um, kind of near the end of the edit, but not finished, and we showed that at the Walker for a private event only for only cast and crew. Mm -hmm. But they had a beautiful state-of-the-art projection system there. Mm -hmm. And we were able to show the widescreen, full resolution DCP with our our almost finished sound and beautiful colorization. Mm -hmm. It was the first time we looked at it and we we realized, wow, this is amazing on the screen. We've never seen it on the screen before. Mm -hmm. And just that state-of-the-art projection, all of all of that 
felt like it finally paid off, even though it was a private screening yeah. for cast and crew. We finally saw the movie, and that was a precious day for all of us. Absolutely. Was that like an ah moment? Like, ah, we did it, you know? Breath well, we fresh sat air. in and tested the DCP a few times, because sure. at that time we were just making our own DCP. Right. And because we had to get it for the screening in a couple yes. of days. But the projectionist was, was really helpful and allowed us to work a few things out as we got the bugs out. So we saw clips and clips and clips of it in tests <laughs> and then when the audience came we saw the whole thing mm-hmm. well, and then a, a comment on that of you know it, it was a kind of a sigh of relief and it was one of those things where it was and it was like wow look how far we came and look what ma- movie we made but then getting around to distribution and actually getting it out it's like okay great we're here but no we're still <laughs> no, still right. working it's, still it, 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 it's not done yeah <laughs> so so yeah it was an exciting the and business really man awesome. in the room is always working <laughs> yeah yeah so it was awesome seeing it on the at, you know at the walker and like yeah. bringing out so many friends and family and crew and you know it, it was a really cool special event definitely um for all of us that helped make it um and a, a good checkpoint, a good encouragement along the way, but you know, really, um, once, it, once it's out, once everyone can watch it anywhere, like that's when you know that's when it's done, in my opinion. So, yeah. <laughs> and this film might have been able to come out like six or eight months earlier mm-hmm. had we gotten a distrib- distributor earlier. Um, but we kind of look at it now as a blessing in disguise. At that time, we're like, what? We're going to have to wait? Mm-hmm. But now we're able, to, we started to aim getting into the fall. We said, how about the election year 2020? And the yeah. distributor that we are working with, Cine Dime, mm-hmm. they, they really liked that idea. They thought that is going to be a hook. Mm-hmm. And so these like, difficulties become positives in the end. Right. Absolutely. It so, didn't fit in. It did. Yeah. <laughs> So, favorite moment from day one to right now in this process on this film for each of you? I mean, really being on set was uh, uh, really entertaining. Like, for example, of just making the world come together of, you know, southern Alabama in the hot southern night, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, out there having a party. And it's really about 38 degrees. And if you stand <laughs> too far away from the fire barrel, like they can see your breath. So it's yeah. like there's this scene where they're around the bonfire, but they have to be there because otherwise, you know, if they're too far away, you mm-hmm. can tell it's like, oh, it's actually really cold. And, you know, they're all wearing T-shirts and this kind of thing out there, mm-hmm. you know, even though it's yeah, the goosebumps really, come yeah. up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I mean, that's just a testament to the, the cast and the crew. And so like seeing that and the, the energy and kind of commitment of the people at that point in the process mm-hmm. um, was really encouraging and just a really cool moment. And, you know, this is the middle of the night and like yeah. all night shoots. So it was real, like that was really cool seeing it come together. Mm-hmm. So, and then going from there, but that was definitely an idea of how much energy and passion people had for it. Yeah. Um, as a director, my favorite moments were like having beers with the cast especially Devin Mm -hmm. at night and, and really getting passionate like artists do. Mm -hmm. And that's when the blood starts boiling. We're, we're passionate because we want to create a better product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those discussions to me are really exciting. They can get very contentious, but in the end we're still friends because we're really vying for a better uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. And I remember that even way back when I started filmmaking, with super independent filmmakers, how we would, you know, have beers and argue about the creativity of our project. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're actually shooting a film and arguing about the creativity of a project that's actually happening Mm -hmm. is so exciting. That's my favorite part. Absolutely. Two favorite moments. um, And one is sort of a bookend. We talked about that stunt scene. It was two nights. I went from at 3 p.m. sitting in my backyard. This is the day before we were about to shoot that night. And I mm-hmm. told my wife, I was like, I have completely failed. I have failed. Mm-hmm. Like, because we just, I was like, this is not going to happen. It's not going to yeah. happen. You know, and then fast forward, you know, two night shoots. And then we're, you know, sun's coming up and we're drinking beers with the stunt guys. And we just <laughs> yeah. had some of the magic. And, you know, those are, that's just the. the I've you know, had those nights. We've yes, all I had know. those, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The payoff is yes. just, it's the, it's the best. 
you know, it's just the best and you're sweating bullets and you just get through it. <laughs> so that one really stands out for me. And then the other one, but the singular best moment and Philip already alluded to this, but it's the first time we did that test screening at the Walker and mm -hmm. put the DCP up in the first screen and we saw the widescreen mm -hmm. the first time. Cause you know, you're spending literally a year, well, eight months in your, your, you know, you're editing at a very small scale mm -hmm. and all of yeah. a sudden you see it on the big screen and it's cinema. Yeah. And yeah. in cinema is not an edit anymore. It's mm -hmm. not a small monitor. And uh, it's just, it's beauty. It's art. It's everything's worth it at that moment. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, could probably never win that moment back. It's the first look, you know, at right. that right. scale. And it's just, then it's, it's the magic that we, it, there's a reason why we all work towards that magic. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks, guys, for coming out. Um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to... Congratulations on thank finishing you. your film. You made a film, period. And we got distribution. <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> it's phenomenal. And while we were doing this interview, you saw me on my phone because I'm texting back and forth with YG. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we just sent him a poster design and... You know, we want him to look like a rap star and all of these things. <laughs> yes. And mm -hmm. it's really nerve wracking to send something out like that. Mm -hmm. But he responded, you know, fire, fire emojis. <laughs> yes, fire. yes, yes. <laughs> Phenomenal. That's going on the gram. No, yep. <laughs> thanks. thanks so much for having us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks again. This has uh, been great talking about it and a great process. And I uh, hope you all enjoy the film. Absolutely. Yeah, and I hope to have you guys back whenever you guys make your next one. So, yeah. all right. For Film in Minnesota, I'm Alan. I'm Rahana. See you guys next time.